Hello, everyone. For those of you that are in the room and watching online, thank you for being here with us today. For those of you I may not have had the privilege to meet, my name is David Howitt, and I'm a son of Renita's. And I want to take this opportunity just to start by saying thank you to everybody. I didn't expect to get emotional at this part. This is weird. Um, but we have uh, really, truly been blessed by the outpouring of love and support from all of you um, over these last couple of months. And we have such a tremendous community of friends and family around us, and it has been felt. Um, and so we just, I just want to say thank you. Um, we are extremely grateful for each of you. To get us started today, I would like to open us in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to read my mom's obituary, and then I'll share a few thoughts. So will you please bow your heads in prayer? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to honor the memory and the life of my mom, Renita Howitt. But more importantly, I thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy in her life and in ours. Lord, I just pray for all of us as we grieve and mourn the loss of a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a friend. Lord, I pray that you would bring comfort and peace as only you can. Lord, I just pray that this day would be glorifying to you. Lord, that everything we do and say today, that it would bring honor to your name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. On June 11, 1953, Renita Annette was born to William and Jeanette Vandermeulen. She was the oldest of 10 children and spent her childhood years in Whitby, Ontario. Theirs was a God-fearing, church-going family, which would have a significant impact on the rest of Renita's life. She accepted Jesus as her savior when she was a child. After completing high school, Renita attended Hope College in Michigan, where she earned a bachelor's degree majoring in English. She taught school for two years before marrying Robert Fred Howitt. The military brought them to Tacoma, Washington in 1984, where Renita would spend the rest of her life. Renita has touched countless lives as she taught elementary level school for 22 years, had a Sunday school class, led a women's Bible study, reached out to neighbors, kept in touch with many friends, entertained in her home, brought meals to families in need, always pointing others to Christ. She especially had a heart for children and was very involved in the lives of her children and her grandchildren. Some of Renita's interests included reading, writing poetry, outdoor walks and nature trails, and studying the Word of God. She also spent many hours in prayer for those to whom she ministered. After battling cancer for over seven years, God called Renita home on November 22, 2023, at the age of 70. She is preceded in death by her parents, one sister, Angela. She is survived by two sisters, Celia and Wendy, and six brothers, Pete, Art, Mark, Gary, Frank, and Ken as well as her children, Yannicka Saxtetter and her husband, Steve, Naomi Drew and her husband, Warren, yours truly, and my wife, Emily, and Stephen Howitt and his wife, Haley, as well as nine grandchildren, Clarissa, Curtis, Sonny, Asher, Kendall, Corinne, Penny, Brielle, and Addison. Renita often said that she considered Psalm 23, verse 6 to be her life verse. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I think of my mom, there are a few things that jump out at me. But one of the main ones has to be her love of humor. She loved to laugh. One of the comic strips that always got her going was The Far Side by Gary Larson. I remember one in particular that she shared with me once. It was where two deer were standing in a forest, and one of them had a giant bullseye on its chest, and... The other one says to it, bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> I'll never forget how hard she laughed at that. And if, if you know my mom, you know when she got laughing, she got laughing. And that was one of those ones that got her laughing. I'll also never forget the time she took my brother Steve and me ice skating when we were kids. And at one point, she said she was going to teach us how to properly come to a stop. She grew up in Ontario, Canada. It's cold there. They ice skated a lot as a kid. She was an expert, right? So she skated off a distance, and then she started coming towards us at a pretty good clip. And as she pulled up to us, she promptly had both feet just slide out from underneath her, and she hit the ice like a sack of potatoes. I saw how hard she fell. I heard the thud, and I'd experienced my own fair share of wipeouts, more than I'd care to admit. So I knew exactly how much that must have hurt. But she popped right up, 
And with a laugh, she said, I guess what I meant to say was, I'm going to teach you how not to stop. We were laughing at that pretty hard. She didn't laugh about it as hard a couple of days later when she found out that she had, in fact, broken a bone in her hand as a result of the fall. But despite that, she was still able to find the humor in it, especially when she pictured what it must have looked like to anyone else who may have witnessed it. This humor persisted even in her final days. There would be times when she would randomly start laughing and we would say, what are you, what are you laughing about? And she would just say, oh, you just have to be there. Or another time, she was laughing at something Louise had said. Louise is a good family friend who traveled from Idaho to stay with my family and, and help care for my mom. Louise, if you're watching this, uh, you're a godsend, and I want to say personally thank you for everything. But mom was laughing at something she said, and, and mom said, that's a good one. I got to remember that. But I already forgot. <laughs> Another thing that jumps out, about me, uh, about my, jumps out to me about my mom is her love of history and science. She was always reading an autobiography or a biography or something from the kings of queens, kings and queens of England to Ernest Shackleton's Antarctic expeditions to physics. This was a love that she and I shared. Maybe not the physics part. But as I grew older, we would just nerd out with each other over various topics that interested us from astronomy to meteorology uh, to history, and more recently, biblical archaeology. It was during the course of these conversations that I found my mom to be more than just my mom, but a great friend as well. And I miss these conversations with her dearly. Above all, though, what characterized my mom in her life was her love for the Lord and his word, and more importantly, his love and faithfulness to her. She experienced some significant storms in her life, from a divorce that left her raising us kids on her own, on a private school teacher's salary, to the cancer diagnosis in 2016. She experienced grief, anxiety, fear, discouragement, as we all do during times of difficult circumstances. But through it all, the Lord was her constant companion, protector, and provider. Much of the Lord's provision in her life came through those who are in the family of God, acting through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, many of whom are in attendance today or watching online. The gifts of support, the encouragement, the friendship over the years, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of my family, I want to say thank you for the tremendous impact you had on my mom's life, your obedience to the Lord. We are extremely grateful. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace that transcends understanding. Peace that doesn't make sense, given the circumstances. That was the reality for mom. Those of you who knew my mom know that she lived life with genuine joy and peace. That doesn't mean she didn't have moments, as I just mentioned, of the natural human emotions of grief, anxiety, and so on. It just means that in those moments of vulnerability, instead of being consumed by it, she turned to the Lord and he never once let her down. Whether it was meeting a physical need or provision or the need for comfort, joy, and peace, the Lord never failed to meet her needs. I'll never forget the night we were sitting around the dining room table. It was a normal weeknight, just like any other. But mom had recently gotten in a car accident. She was fine, but the car was totaled, and she didn't have the means to buy a new car at the time. She never voiced the concern to me, but looking back, I can only imagine the stress this must have caused her. Her teaching job was a 45-minute drive away, and that job provided for all of us. She needed a car, and now she didn't have one or the means to get one. Then the phone rang. It was someone from the Tacoma Saturn dealership calling mom to tell her there was a car there for her. All the paperwork was done, the cost had been covered, all she had to do was come get the key and take the car home. And just like that, mom had a new car that she drove for years after that. It's an example of what I mentioned a moment ago, of someone in the family of God who had the provision being obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and they bought my mom a car. But the glory goes to the Lord, for it was he who gave them the provisions to begin with, and it was he who knew my mom's need and saw it taken care of. Recently, after mom had passed, I was at her house with some of my siblings, cleaning and going through her things, and I was the last one to leave. I was in her room going through some paperwork, and the thought suddenly came to me. I wonder how many nights mom laid here alone. 
not able to sleep due to the thoughts swirling in her head. I wonder how I'm going to pay this bill or missing marriage or her marriage and the life that she had, pondering the cancer and all the discomfort that came with it, and that it would, barring a miracle of God, ultimately claim her life. It was hard for me to think about, and it reminded me of the night we got her, the day we got her cancer diagnosis back in 2016. The thought that kept me awake that night wasn't the diagnosis. It wasn't the, th- the thought that we might lose mom. It was the thought that she was alone in that hospital room and what thoughts must be running through her head. But as I was in my mom's room, I was reminded of the story of Hagar in Genesis 16. It's a longer story, so I won't get into the whole backstory. But in short, Hagar was an Egyptian handmaiden of Sarah, Abraham's wife who had fled while she was pregnant because she was being treated harshly by Sarah and she couldn't take it anymore. And as she is fleeing, the Lord appears to her by a spring on the road back to Egypt. And in Genesis 16, verse 11, we read that the Lord tells Hagar that the Lord has heard of your misery. And he ultimately tells Hagar to return to Sarah, but he gives her a promise that a great nation would arise from the son that she would give birth to. Hagar responds by saying, you are the God who sees me. One of the names of God, El Roy, the God who sees. And I realized that in all of those moments, my mom was never alone. The Lord never left her side. Every fear, every anxiety, every tear, he was present through it all, giving her comfort and reminding her of his promises. And so while we are here today to honor the memory of my mom, Renita Annette Howitt, and what she meant to all of us, we are ultimately here to honor the Lord because that's what my mom would want. Honor the Lord for his faithfulness, his goodness, his promises, in mom's life and in all of ours. I've heard it said that if everything was stripped away and all we were left with was the Lord, then we would have more than we could ever need and more than we would ever deserve. That was true for my mom, and it's true for those of us who belong to the Lord as well. But now I'd like to read just a couple of verses that came to me the morning my mom passed, back on November 22nd, an excerpt from Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. I mentioned at the beginning that one of my mom's hobbies was writing poetry, and I would like to share a couple of them with you now. They're short. Um, But the first one is derived from Matthew 20, verse 15. And she wrote, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Says he who such grace and kindness has shown. The one who paid the highest price at Calvary would never send trouble needlessly. There are purposes we do not now understand, but quietly trust in his goodness who planned. The refiner walks with us in the fire. The potter carefully molds to his heart's desire. In ways we ourselves would never choose, he prepares a vessel fit for his use. And the second one was from Isaiah 54, verse 11. It says, Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. His ways are not my ways, his thoughts far higher. He always does what is best for me, weans from this earth and prepares for eternity. Though grief intervenes, I know the end of the story, one day to appear with him in his glory. This is not my home, this weary, dreary place, but in the presence of his gentle face. Oh, if this trial has to be, may it yield, Lord, fruit for thee. Praise the Lord that that's her reality now. And then the last one is a little bit lighter. And it's called, Are We Having Fun Yet? And it's about playing a game of chess. So the answer to that question is no. (laughs) We are not having fun yet. 
But she writes, I didn't really notice how I got into this mess. I am merely a novice, and this is a most serious game of chess. His brow is furrowed, his face is grim, as he plans his next stratagem. I try to look wise and act so prim, but my moves are little more than whim. My knight is captured by his pawn. I am horrified and stifle a yawn. With a few pieces left, I battle on. Did the Hundred Years' War last this long? At last he begins to sing and makes the move which ends everything. I am the loser and he is the king, my ten-year-old darling. Now, Steve, I don't know which one of us she was talking about, but I don't recall ever having won a game of chess, so it must have been you. Congratulations on the victory. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce to you my sister, Yannicka, her husband, Steve, and their kids, Clarissa, Curtis, and Corinne, who will be singing a song called Be Still My Soul. This was my mom's favorite song over the last several months of her life, and one that she individually shared with each of us at one point or another because she was enjoying it so much. The lyrics are included on the bulletin, um, and they'll also be on the screen behind me if you would like to read along. Thank you.
This will be uh, not a long presentation of the gospel. But I'm going to take a few minutes here. I'm going to read some scriptures. You can follow along or listen in. <clears throat> I'm going to read out of the old King James translation. Uh, turn to a few different scriptures and I'm going to begin by reading some verses. Out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse beginning with verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We had these verses before us on Thanksgiving Day, the day after my mom passed away. This passage, this passage was suggested, and it was very fitting, very comforting for the time. But you know, as we went over this, there was one verse in particular that stood out, the first verse that I read. And really, two words really stuck out, stuck out. The last two words of that verse, no hope. That you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. And I wonder if there's someone here or someone listening in on the live stream are those who have no hope. You know, we who are believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a living hope. Scripture says we have a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is our hope. And we who are believers, not that we would take any credit for ourselves, for it's all of God, but we have many, many precious promises. And a couple of the promises we might find in these verses that I have read, that we will see the Lord, we will meet him in the air and be with him for all eternity where he is. But you know, there's something else. That those who, uh, that those who have passed away, they have not missed out because there will be a resurrection. Notice that word that I, that I read in the first verse, asleep. That is a temporary thing. So it is at night when, we, when our heads hit the pillow, we expect to fall asleep and to wake up soon. That's a temporary thing. And so it is with those who are dead in Christ, a temporary thing, because there will be a resurrection. And you know, there will be a grand reunion in the air as we meet the Lord. He will be the attraction, but we'll be, there will be a reunion with those loved ones who have passed away. And so, those who are asleep. My mom's body is, is in the grave. Her soul is with the Lord. This happened at death, the separation of soul from the body. But that is a temporary thing because of this resurrection. Her body will be risen from that grave. So I'm going to turn to a verse in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 6, and verse 39. This is the Lord's words speaking about this resurrection. John 6, verse 39. This is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. 
How many saints down through the last 2,000 years have passed away and been completely forgotten about? There are those who have passed away recently, such as my mom, who we remember and who we loved, and others who we have heard about, who have given their lives up through martyrdom or missionaries who we know about. But for the most part, almost every saint who has passed away has been completely forgotten about but not to the Lord. It says, he says that he will lose none. He will raise them all up at the last day. And you know, my mom, she had that hope. For the last seven and a half years as she battled cancer, she had that hope before her. She knew that the Lord was her present help in trouble and that there was this resurrection and that she was going to meet the Lord. We were at a funeral several years ago And this was at a funeral of someone who professed to be a believer. And she remarked after the funeral how sad it is that the Lord was not mentioned, not even once. My mom wanted the Lord to be spoken of at her memorial. She wanted the gospel to be presented, the good news of salvation through the Lord Jesus to be presented. Because she wanted everyone listening, everyone here, to have this hope also. But not just her, but God wants everyone to have this hope also. It says in 1 Timothy 2, Our Savior God, who will have all men to be saved, all of mankind to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He is a Savior God. He is a God of love. Also in 2 Peter 3, it says that he's not willing that any should perish eternally but that all should come to repentance. In the 14th verse that I read, it says that it's if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then he will bring with him. It's if we believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe today that on the cross, Jesus took your place under the judgment of God and has forever settled the question of sin before God. God has provided so that we could be saved through the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross if we believe. If you have not had the question of your sins settled, then you will have to bear the punishment of your sins for all eternity. Because God is a just God. You know, God is love, but he is also light. He knows the actions of everyone here, everyone listening. He knows all of your actions. He knows all of your thoughts. It says he knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In the Old Testament, it says that the Lord looks not as man looks, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He knows the thoughts and the actions of everyone here. But after this work of Christ on Calvary's cross, when he suffered for sin, God has a righteous basis to justify the sinner that believes on Jesus I'm going to look at a few verses in Romans chapter 5. See a few things there where we have that the love of God reaches out to the human race, which is completely unlovable, such as the love of God. Romans 5, verse 6, because maybe there's some here who, who thinks I'm a pretty strong person, Yes, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, but I've got many strengths. I'm a, I've got a very strong personality, and God will accept me. It says in Romans 5, 6, that when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Without Christ, there is nothing you can do to help yourself in regard to your sin and your eternal state. Verse 8, 
Because maybe there's some thinking, I'm not such a bad person. I might have done a few wrong things, but the good things outweigh the bad things, and God will accept me. Romans 5, 8. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has proclaimed that you are a sinner. He has proclaimed that there is none righteous, no, not one. He has proclaimed that the whole world is guilty before God and that you are a sinner, born in sin, and there's nothing you can do to help yourself. Verse 10, because maybe there's some listening who would say, well, I'm not a Christian, but I've got friends and family who are Christians, and I'm, I support them. I'm okay with their beliefs, and I support Christianity. I'm, not, I'm friendly enough with God and God will accept me. But Romans 5 and verse 10 says, For if it's when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. God has said that we were enemies and we were far from God. Being the enemy was our part. God's part was doing the reconciling. And all of this is through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, the death of God's son. Just think about those words that I read at the beginning. No hope. I'm going to read part of a verse in Ephesians 2. This is written to believers, but referring to a time before they believed. Roman, uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 12. I'm just going to read part of the verse. That at that time ye were without Christ having no hope and without God in the world. What a solemn position to be in, completely hopeless. If we're sick, at least we can hope that tomorrow will feel better. If there's financial struggles, we hope maybe that business will pick up in the coming months. It's good to have hope, but there are those who have no hope. The verses that I read in Thessalonians speak of the resurrection of those who are believers, those who are dead in Christ. But there's more. I won't turn to it, but it's in Revelation 20. You see the, another group of people who have been resurrected. And it's not those who have died in faith and they are resurrected and they see the Lord and they rejoice to see their Savior and their friend. But it's those who have been resurrected and they have died in unbelief. They have rejected God and the gift of his Son. And they will see the Lord too, but meet the Lord as their righteous judge. And so how is it with everyone here and everyone listening? Will you see the Lord as your, as your shepherd and your friend and you will rejoice or will you see him as your judge? Because I can say with 100% certainty, with authority of the word of God, that everyone will see the Lord. They will be cast into the lake of fire. It's because of this coming judgment that God commands all sinners, all of mankind to repent. Repent from your sins. Have a complete change of mind and turn to God. You know, there might be some sorrow here today when we, uh, when we carried my mom. Uh, <clears throat> in a casket to the burial site. There was sorrow and there were tears shed. There was not many people there, but there was sorrow. The Lord knows what it's like to sorrow at the grave of a loved one. But you know, there's a verse in Luke 15 that says that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And so there may be some sorrow but there can be joy today if there's one sinner that repents and turns to God. There is one more verse that I'd like to turn to. Because as I thought about after we had that little reading 
And I thought about those verses. There's another verse I thought of that has two words that stick out, and I'm going to read the whole verse. It's Romans 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And it's those last two words that I was thinking about, without excuse. There's not one listening who can say that God never gave them a chance. There's not, not one who says they have an excuse because everyone has at least the witness of creation. That there, is a, that there is an order to this creation and that there is a God with whom we have to do, we will have to answer to. It says in the first verse of the 19th Psalm that the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse shows his handiwork. There's not one here. If you stand before the Lord as your judge, you will have an argument and have an excuse. So I just ask, before I close, that how is it with everyone here in your soul? Have you taken the Lord Jesus Christ? God is pleading for everyone here to take his son in this free gift of salvation. It's a free gift. He paid the price. It's free for us. Just believe. Let's pray. Close. Our God and Father, we just pray that you might bless these few words and these verses. We're just thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross that this message, the good news, can be such, with such simplicity. So we just pray this, as, that we can speak about the Lord at this time, as we also remember my mother as well. So we just ask for a blessing on this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. There is a, a hymn, a congregational hymn that we're all going to sing. The lyrics will be on the screen.
just wanted to say thank you again to everyone that is here today. I know some travel the distance to be here, um, and we greatly appreciate it. I'm just going to close us with another quick word of prayer, and then I'll have a couple of announcements, and that will conclude our service today. So please bow with me in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your love for us. I thank you that while we were still sinners, while we had nothing of quality that we could stand on, you looked down on us in compassion and in mercy, and you sent your one and only son to pay the, to pay the price that we owed, that we could have the hope that my mom had of eternal life. And Lord, I thank you that one day all of us will see my mom again, to hear her laugh, to, hear, to, to worship you with her, to revel in your presence and in your glory, but most important of all, that we will all be together in your presence with you of the object of our worship, of our love, and of our gratitude. You are the only one that is worthy. And so, Lord, while we honor mom today and we, we thank you for her life, we thank you for what she meant to all of us, her testimony, her witness, her character, all of these things, we give you glory and we give you praise as the author of it all. Bless us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, everybody. Mark Rogers here again, and we have a session of the program called basically the stories behind the hymns. Who are the hymn writers? This one we're going to focus in on Jesus Loves Me. And with me, I have Michael Bryan, who you well know, and he has enjoyed many hymns. And this is one of these. And of course, He's had quite a year. I have had quite a year. Many of us have had quite a year. And our featured guest coming right up has had quite a year as well. And so I wanted to bring Mike on and bring guests on. So, Mike, who do you have to introduce to us? Well, good evening, Brother Mark. This evening I have my dear friend and sister in Christ, Renita Howard and... Renita has been calling me faithfully for the last four years, at least, maybe. Yeah, at eight o'clock every weekday morning. And we share, um, she always has something good for us to enjoy. And, and it's just been, sister, I, I can't even thank you enough. For it's a two way street, brother. It's a two-way street. <laughs> it uh, when the Lord provides like He has, it's a double blessing. So I just wanted to say thank you, and it's been such a joy to get to know you and to be your friend and your brother in Christ. This the roads that the Lord has chosen for us. They're not the ones that necessarily reverse. Hmm. But, but when we submit and surrender our wheels to his, the blessing just compounds and flows, and you are one of those blessings. To <laughs> you are a blessing to me, Mike, definitely. Lord is good, like you always Amen. like to say. Yeah. Jesus Loves Me was written by uh, Anna Warner, who was born in New York City in 1827. She had an older sister, Susan. Her father was a lawyer, a, a successful lawyer. So they lived in a beautiful home in New York City, but their mom had passed away when they were young. So they lived in a uh, yeah, in a well-to-do home for quite a while, but in 1837, apparently, there was a financial crisis that had affected many in the United States, including, including her father. He lost a lot of money, and the family had to move to a ramshackle home, it was described as being, uh, on Constitution Island in the Hudson River. So they went from a lovely home to a ramshackle home, not not nice living conditions. And uh, this was hard on the girls. 
but they had to, uh, they decided to write and uh, to supplement the family income to help with the finances. And they ended up writing over a hundred books and some co-authored, but individually many books. And one of the books that became a second bestseller to Uncle Tom's Cabin at the time was called Say and Seal. And in the story, there is a little boy named Johnny who is dying. And his Sunday school teacher comes to comfort this little boy. And the book was actually written by Susan, but the words to the song, Jesus Loves Me, was written by Anna. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so this Sunday school teacher sang this song to the boy in the story. And um, later on, several years later, a gentleman named William Bradford wrote the simple childlike tune that we sing today to those words. He wrote the melody, William Bradford. And uh, that song, like Mark said, has become the most well-known children's song in the whole world. And uh, it's just, it's also nice to know that these sisters, for 50 years, when they lived in this home on Constitution Island, they had, they hosted a Bible study in their home for uh, cadets from West Point. West Point was just across the Hudson River from where they were at. So once a week, cadets would come over and they would host a Bible study and provide lemonade and cookies for these guys. And they did this for over 50 years. And... Susan and Anna Porter are the only civilians buried in a military, um, in a military, yeah, buried in a military place. So they had, they were well loved and honored by the men in the military. But anyway, so it was written by Anna as in a book, and that a Sunday school teacher sang to this little boy when he was dying. That's the background of the story. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I would really. And so this is the point I'd like to go ahead. And and for those that don't know the song, I'm going to basically um, play the tune. Jesus loves me, this I know. Beautiful. 
Wonderful. Mike, what do you think about that hymn? Uh, it's just probably the first hymn I ever learned. And first many, many kids probably ever learned. That's one we can take with us through our whole life, isn't it? And, uh, you know, that, that verse about when we are weak, he is strong. That um, that comes to my thoughts often because the weaker I get, the more I appreciate his strength. And, uh, it's um, something a simple childlike him like this can contain so much, so much truth. Just like the Word of God, just. Beautiful how it can apply our entire lives. And then you, Renita, what what is what is the hymn meant for you? I know you've been and first for those that you know, I know we don't like to talk about our trials, but Anita Renita has been fighting cancer for, for years now. And um, during these times of if anybody's gone through the experience of cancer, my dad went through the experience of cancer for 12, 13 months. And so I've, I've seen that and I've seen the effects on others, but with your experience, Renita, what is this hymn? How has this hymn been so precious to you? Well, just, you know, just to know how much the Lord loves us. And uh, I just want to share a little experience where the Lord comforted me. This is quite a while ago. I was sitting in a chemo chair waiting for my infusion and I was, com I confessed to complaining to the Lord, like, Lord, I don't want to be here. How long do I have to do this? Why is this happening to me? And uh, I realized, you know, those thoughts were wrong. And I thought, Lord, I need your, I need an encouragement. And so I asked the Lord for help. And he directed me to Philippians 4. Philippians 4 talks about rejoicing in the Lord, be anxious for nothing, but by everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I thought, Lord, that's what I need. I need joy. I need peace. So I opened my Bible, and I turned to Philippians 1. But you know what? Those were not the verses the Lord had for me. I read the first verse, and I thought, this is what the Lord had for me. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. So stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Twice he addressed, you know, he addresses the Philippians as my beloved. But I just heard the Lord saying to me, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. And it was such a comfort and peace. And to hear him speaking to me, those precious words, and to know that he was right there with me. He knows all about everything, what's happening to me and to you. And we individually, each of us, are his well-beloved. So Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, that encaps encapsulates that, that precious truth that we will enjoy for all eternity how much we are loved by our Creator, our God and Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a comfort, my beloved. I know I uh, you weren't here for Sunday school, Rania, but I had it here one or two Sundays ago, and I said, do you know that the Lord Jesus is thinking about you right now? <laughs> yes. You know, he loves you so much. He's thinking about you right now. How do I know that? Well, I know that because when he was hanging on the cross, he was thinking about you as he took your sins, you know? So he has, and he's so excited to be with us. He's so excited. I mean, I don't use, I use that reverently, obviously, but he wants to be with us. And the question is, how bad do I want to be with him? Hmm. Anything yes. there, Mike? Oh, I just so enjoy it. But what our sister shared there was just beautiful. Um, he knows what we need when we need it. Amen. And yeah. We just... Uh, but we have nothing to fear when we truly enter into that. So thank you so much. 
Well, we're not done with Renita because here's the thing. You heard in that song, you heard in that song that the kids were singing, they, there was another verse or two. So there's different verses that are are out there for Jesus Loves Me. And um, Renita, with your trial you've gone through, you have got another verse that you have put together. So you said you wanted to sing. Was it verse three, was it? Yeah. In our little hymn book, it says, um, he will watch me from on high, from his shining home on high, he will watch me where I lie. And I thought that makes the Lord sound rather distant. So I just, just altered alter one, one line, line and, and we mop him up with this verse. verse. Very nice. I heard, I heard an echo singing, singing that. that. There was an echo. Yes, there yeah. was an echo. I was trying to trying to kill it's it. So. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> you sounded like you're in an auditorium. <laughs> oh, that sounded great. Oh, wonderful. How wonderful, wonderful that he is so near us. Yes. He's not, uh, not a distant Savior. All the way home, Savior, they, it's been said, right? Amen. Yep. From Well, thank you, Mark, for putting this together, brother. Yes. Well, thank you for offering to, to pick up this hymn. And I didn't even, when I was putting it out there to to cover profiles of hymns, I didn't even think about this hymn. And so that's, thank you for, for both doing that and, and um, certainly coming from a background that you've been through both trials, um, the most simplistic hymns you know, what we call simplistic, have the most meaning, the most richness during a time of extreme trial. So it's uh, beautiful to, to, to really glimpse on that for a little bit. So with that, I guess uh, we'll be continuing on and, and uh, we'll see if we can focus on some other hymns shortly. But thank you for the both of you. And so we'll go ahead and wrap up and uh, catch you on the next one. She was just such a bright, bright testimony. <laughs> Can't wait till we're all together. Yep. Well, think, think, think about this, Mike. I was thinking about this. Is, is she's in the Lord's arms, right? The Lord yep. is greeting those those wounds in His hands, and He's there to greet the, everyone coming through. And well done, thou good and faithful servant, right? I mean, Amen. how beautiful for her to hear those words from him. Yep. Yep. How wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're gonna miss you're gonna miss the um the uh she 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 called you daily, was that it, and read the calendar yeah. to you? Yeah, we read all, all kinds of different uh devotion devotionals and books, but mm -hmm. eight o'clock every morning. Yep. And uh it was just such an unexpected and beautiful friendship that just totally centered on the Lord Jesus. Right. And it's just uh, such a gift uh, to me uh, from the Lord. And she's a dear, uh, my eternal friend. Right. We're going to spend eternity together. It's wonderful that we get the opportunity to have these friendships down here. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they're centered on Christ, there's just an extra richness. Oh. And it's because the fact, too, that you both have been through long, long yeah. trials. And, and the Lord is working individually in each of your lives in a certain measure and he's working in your lives that those of us don't are not going through the trials and don't necessarily experience that same thing. And so it's the same thing with cancer, right? Um, yeah. you know, my dad died of cancer. And so I have had a particular softness in my heart to those that yeah. have gone through the, that cancer. And so um, 
So that's what's so special is that those deep, though that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? right. And you're walking through that valley of the shadow of death. So it's. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it's a privilege to walk together. And, uh, she was just a, just a treasure to me. So.